grace, mercy, peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Our focus for this morning is a, is a new theme for the season of Lent as we consider the parables of Jesus, what those stories are trying to teach us and how God draws us into his story, teaching us to tell his, tell his story through our story and as, as we go through this life. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present, that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a family, a couple who had four sons. They grew up in a solid family. The couple showed their boys over and over again what it looked like to have a solid family and a good marriage. They ate all the same uh, meals around the dinner table. They had the same conversations. They heard the same lessons at church. And they grew up to be strong young men who eventually moved away and started families of their own. Now each of them had this, the same upbringing, but each of them had very different expressions of their faith later on in life. The first brother went off to, to college with great desire to have intellectual and scientific knowledge. And in his, his time as, with his desire to be an engineer or some other high-level scientist, he came across a few professors that over time started to help him believe that in this world there is nothing more than matter and energy. And taking on a materialistic worldview over time, the existence of God himself was pushed to the margins. And so the enemy stole the truth from this man. The second brother also went to university with great desire to be a businessman and create things. But it seemed like every business venture that he went after left him empty. Everything was a bump in the road. There was nothing that went smoothly. And over time, his failure added up until he started to wonder if there was such a thing as a good God who would allow that kind of failure in his life. The third brother, quite different from the previous brother, was wildly successful in his business ventures. He became a titan of industry with whatever riches he could possibly want at his fingertips. Beautiful houses and luxury vacations galore. And it didn't come as much of a surprise later on in life when his colleagues found out that he had had an affair and his wife left him. His children never wanted to speak to him ever again. And so he learned that riches may be rich for a time, but in the end, it leaves you empty. The fourth and final brother, the youngest, did what many youngest children do, and they watched the lives of their older siblings. He saw the lives of his three brothers and said, well, I think I know what not to do. And he set off on a very different path. He was mildly successful, made a good life for himself and his family. But everywhere he went, wherever he took an, on a new job, moved to a new place, he invested in the lives of people around him. Not just as human beings, but also because of what Jesus had done for him. He found himself connected to faithful congregations of God's people wherever he went. And he invested in people there. So that... When he died at, some would say, an early age, in his mid-50s, the congregation, the sanctuary where his funeral was held, was filled to the brim with people, and every single person in that, that place had a story, individually, a story about this man and how he invested in their life. As a person, as a human being, but also letting the love of Jesus shine through in every interaction. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Life is about story. That was a story that I made up, 
but you can probably see that actually being someone's story at some place in time. And if you know the, the, the story of the sower, the parable of the sower that Jesus tells, you can probably see some of the parallels. But what does it look like to tell our own story, to see the meaning there, and to see how Jesus uses story to tell us what the kingdom of God is like? You may have noticed the, the title of this sermon series is entitled Kingdom Movements. I think it's, it's a beautiful way of talking about what Jesus does. Wherever Jesus goes, he brings the kingdom of heaven with him. And it's not a, a static thing. It's not something that stays just in one place. It moves. And so where does Jesus want to move people? Where does he want to move their hearts? He wants to move them to places that looks like more, looks more like the kingdom. And as I thought about that word movement, it brought me to this idea of a symphony. Now, before God called me to be a pastor, I was very much convinced that he wanted me to be a musician or a music teacher. So I learned a little bit about that. One of the things I learned is that a symphony is a very specific type of piece of music. It's usually or almost always made up of four movements. That's just what they're called. So every symphony is one complete piece of communication, musical communication, sectioned off into different chapters or movements. So while each different, different movement will tell a different part of the story, there is a complete whole at the end. And I think this tells us a little bit about what Jesus is doing in his parables, because we find this quite often in Scripture, that it's parable after parable after parable, and it usually starts something like this. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, both of those are kind of used interchangeably. And that word like tips us off that this is a simile. There's a difference between similes and metaphors, if you remember that from English class. Metaphors are, this is something, it's a direct comparison, whereas a simile is like and as. So the kingdom of heaven is like a sower who sowed his seed. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a couple who had four sons. This is how the formula goes. And you may have noticed we have a, a new banner up to kind of set that as the, the tone for this sermon series, as well as another banner that tells us a little bit about the, the parable of the sower. There'll be a few more going up throughout the season of Lent to help tell that story. Now, one of the other things I learned a little bit about um, in my studies of music was conducting. I haven't conducted in a long time, but one of the things I realized is that when a conductor raises his or her wand, there's a bit of communication that happens right then and there. Now, with a younger, maybe a more distractible musical group, you might get a little bit of this. And what does that mean? It means pay attention. Tune in. I want your full attention so we can do something here. But beyond that, when the conductor raises the baton, what they're trying to communicate is something like this. We're going somewhere, and I'm going to take you there. There's a bit of, of musical movement that happens. There's a reason why a bit of a symphony is called a movement. We're going somewhere, and I'm going to take you there. Not unlike the stories that Jesus tells. Jesus takes us to places where he wants our hearts to go when he tells the stories. And so when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, what he's saying is, lean in. I'm going to take you somewhere. And that's where we find ourselves in this story about the sower. If you're looking for a place to land in your Bible, if you have one, you can get one from the pew as well. Matthew 13 is where we find a whole group of these parables. And we'll be looking at some of these as well as another chapter throughout the season of Lent. So this is how Jesus tells this story. Verse 3. He told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears 
listen. Now, it's not exactly they all lived happily ever after, but it is kind of a signal of the end of the story. So what does this story have to tell us? Well, what we learn about parables is that there can often be three different characters or pieces of the, of the story, and each means something different. Some people will try to say there's only one interpretation for each parable, but it, the, the story means something different to each of these different characters. So the obvious character is the sower. And the Lord, lesson we learn from the sower is that God sows his word and his grace into the world liberally. And he does that without distinguishing between the good soil and the bad soil. Now, those are the other two characters. The fruitful soil is a better way of putting it, and the unfruitful soil. Obviously, the unfruitful soil is divided, subdivided into three separate groups, but those are the two that we're dealing with. To the unfruitful soil, it's a warning. It's a warning that you don't want to be unfruitful. What do you want to look back on at the end of your life? Do you want to have a legacy that's worth hanging on to? Do you want to have invested in the lives of people who are eternal? Or do you want a big bank account? Or a string of successes that may not mean a whole lot? It's a tough thing to hear if that's where you are. But it's a good warning to turn and become fruitful. And there's always hope. That's what Jesus came to bring. Movement towards the kingdom, towards fruitful soil. Because when you invest in the lives of people, you're doing something that is eternal and good. This is what Jesus comes to do in the lives around him. And he is willing to go through anything, spare, spare no expense to show us his love. Now, most people will say that the seed is the word of God. And that's a fine interpretation. The grace of God being liberally poured out on all people in the world. I, I don't think we would say that the, the Judean farmer, who Jesus is probably pointing to in telling this story, was thinking, there's some rocky soil over there. I'm going to throw my seed there. But you know as well as I do that when you, you sow seed, some of it is going to fall in places where you don't intend it. And the thing is, the sower doesn't sweat that. He lets it fall in both places. But here's the thing. To those who are unfruitful and hear that warning, some are not able to bear it. And so instead, taking, instead of taking a look at their own lives, the Pharisees and Jesus' other opponents say, I don't like the sower. I don't like what he's saying. I don't like what he's saying about me. I'm done with him. He needs to go. And so they do away with him. But Good Friday tells us they put him on a cross. They killed the word of life. They killed the one who would bring life to them. But you know as well as I do that Jesus didn't stay dead, that there was resurrection on the other side of that. And this follows beautifully in line with what a seed is. A seed has to die in order for it to rise back into life. And so it is with Jesus, buried in the ground for three days, rises to life and brings life to all those around him, bearing fruit in the most beautiful and magnificent way. And he's still sowing seed. He's still sowing seed through the likes of you and me. Now, some people have that seed sown into their hearts early, and it blooms and grows throughout their entire life. Some have it sown, and it lies dormant for a time, just waiting to burst into life. And some seek to stamp it out. I think I know what kind of ground you want to be. I think you want to have a fruitful life and a legacy that outlives you. I think you want to invest in the lives of people as made in the image of God, dearly loved by him. And that's what Jesus is getting at with this first sally, this first movement of his set of parables. This is the symphony that he's writing. He's willing to die and rise so that you can die and rise. That good news is something that is meant to bloom and grow in your heart. How does it do that? I know so many people will ask me um, after, after we get done with a, a service, okay, pastor, what do I do now? <laughs> right? Where's the practical application? It may be simplistic to put it this way, 
But I think this is a good place to start. Tell your story. I'll bet if you took a few minutes, you could probably think of milestones in your life, great highs or great lows, stories that you like to tell. And if you've noticed this about yourself and others, every time you tell a story, it kind of changes a little bit, right? Some of the details are switched up a little bit. Some of the insight you've gained from the life you've been on since the last time you have told the story kind of seep into it until you have some beautiful, rich narratives that are yours. So what is God trying to tell you in the midst of your story? That's part of it. Some of it comes from telling your story. Some of it comes from thinking about your story. But we're all called to be storytellers. Everybody tells a story, right? What did you do yesterday? You get a story. Where did you go to college? Tell me a story. What do you do in your work life? What does your family look like? Tell me a story. We all tell stories. So tell your story. And see God's hand working in the midst of that story in ways that you maybe hadn't noticed at first. This is the symphony that Jesus draws us all into, and we're all supposed to be moving with him. So don't just tell your story, but live that story. Live boldly, courageously. Have a story to tell. Be fruitful ground, fruitful, and and a place where the gospel can, can not just grow a little bit, but thrive. Hear the word of the Lord and walk with Jesus. Sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? We've got more stories to tell, and I'm guessing you'll be telling some stories as well. Maybe this is something I can encourage you to do. Find a way to tell this parable in your own way. You think you could do that? Come up with your own way of telling the parable of the sower. I took a little bit of time to do that this week. It's kind of fun, actually. So what does the parable of the sower look like in your life? I'd be intrigued to hear that story. But I'm most interested in seeing God's kingdom grow wherever God is moving in the hearts of his people. And he's doing it right now. He's planting seeds in your heart. Will it grow? I pray it does. Would you please pray with me? Father God, we thank and praise you that you give us a story to live as part of your overarching story of redeeming this world. You come to us at our our worst times and at our best times and everything in between. And you walk with us to move us closer to your heart. You give us stories to tell and lessons to learn. And quite often they go together. So we we pray that we would be paying attention to your conductor's baton rising in our lives. That we would pay attention. That we would go with you where you go. And that as we're on that journey, we have plenty of joyful stories to tell as we learn more about your heart and find the life we were designed for in the first place. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, the master storyteller. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts, your minds always in Jesus. Amen.